So I, I got you guys come here today on uh, acronym MINSWAN. Um, some of you probably looked it up, some of you probably know what it means. Um, but guess what? I'm not going to talk about that right now. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart, um, minorities in tech. And the reason I talk about this is because um, I am a good example of a minority who has chosen to pursue a career in technology. And forgive me, um, I had to switch Macs so I don't have my little um, automatic speaker thing. So, we start out, um, a lot of talks start out with uh, a lot of hand raising surveys and things. Um, I'm actually not going to do that because this room is set up weird, so I can't ask you to look to your left and right. I mean, it's kind of like round. But um, take a look to your left and right and, and survey the crowd and, and say to yourself, do people in this room remind me of myself? or do they not remind me of myself? And am, am I different or am I the same? I will tell you, um, when I go to tech events, I do this all the time, and it's just only because um, I am different and I realize that I am different, and I do realize that. So when I go to conference, this is what it looks like. Um, this conference actually is one of the best group conferences ever if anyone can um, identify it, I'll buy you a drink. Over here, Jimmy Branch. Nick was there. But great talk on music, by the way. Thank you. So um, the organizers of uh, course, one of the organizers, um, great guy from Toronto, said, "I want to take a picture of the entire conference," and he did. And this is all the attendees. And guess what? Um, I, I, I looked at this picture and I said, "Well, these guys, you know, what do I have in common? The only thing I have in common with these guys is that we all like to make money and we all like to write code." So, um, why would I want to be a part of this? Um, I always think to myself, hey, you know, I, I want to stand out on my merit. I want to be known for being that guy who cusses all the time on the stage, says things that his kids can't hear. I don't want to be people to say, oh, Brian, that black guy. No, I just don't like that. But guess what? I was a black guy in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I can't take away. I was not the only black guy in that picture. Um, a guy I don't know, and Reg Breakaway were both there, but they're not as black as me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so why am I bringing this up? This is hard to understand. Um, I have a lot of, I, I really do, I do embrace, um, embrace culture, diverse culture. I love being around people who are not like me. And why am I bringing this up? It's hard to understand if you're in, my, if you're in the majority. You might not think about it from the way I look at everyone, and I try to think, well, how can I relate to this to people? Um, people yesterday will know that I sat down, nothing in common, and I just asked you about yourself. And that's just what I want to do. So, so this is something that I tell, um, I tell people that I mentor, and I say, we don't want acceptance. We, I don't want people to accept that I'm here, that I'm a brown guy that's at a Ruby conference. I want to actually belong. Like, People would never, they look at me and they were like, oh, that's not, that's not weird. Or even for women, I can't relate to women, I'm not a woman. But women who come to these Ruby conferences, they want to be accepted. They don't want to, or they want to belong. They don't want to be accepted. Oh, look, there's a woman, or a woman. And you know, I, I don't think they really want that. So, um, let's talk about ethnicities in America. Um, anyone here, about humanity, things like that? Um, so, <coughs> We are, this is an interesting thing. Um, everybody ultimately was immigrant to America. First we had the Irish, and the Germans came, and the Jews, and the Italians, the whole time black people were here. And then now we're getting into more of the middle and far eastern people are coming to the country, and they all went through different periods of adjustment. And unfortunately, and I'm going to speak to black people, and that's all I'm going to speak for, our period of adjustment is still going on. So, we are trying to fix this as a black community. We definitely say, hey, there is a problem, but what can we do to fix this problem? So, one thing I do is I reach out to the youth. Um, I literally picked up the phone the other day and called the CIO of Baltimore and said, hey, you know, I'm a black dude. I make a little bit of money. I have a lot of free time. How can I get back? He put me in touch with somebody at a school, so next year, or this year, I will be going into schools, and I want to be teaching these kids how to focus on math and science. 
I won't be teaching them math and science because I'm not really good at math or science. <laughs> <laughs> but what I will be doing is sharing my love of both of them through um, examples, through code that I've written, showing these people exactly how math and science can get you that car that you saw me driving into. That's the question they always ask me. Where did you get that car? How did you afford it? And I'm also working on removing the negative stereotypes. Um, and this is something very personal to me. Um, there's a big small songs. And in one of the songs, he says, either you got a really jump shot or you're swinging crap, crap rocks. And that, if you listen to it as music, but these little kids from growing up in the city who might have one parent who doesn't care if they eat, go to school, or dress well, when they see this and they see rap stars and they see these basketball players, that's all they can think about. And you know, someone like me, you know, I'm, I'm a nerd to them. Oh well. But guess what? You know what? Is, um, what, I, what I've done in my path to success is actually working. And I don't have to worry about where my next paycheck is coming from, or where I'm going to live, or if I'm going to eat today. I don't have to worry about that. We're trying to remove negative stereotypes of actually being smart. And one of the reasons this happens is because you have to oppress people. And I don't want to get all the male management guys, but if you have to oppress people, they are actually taught that, you know what, success is not a good thing because we are succeed. So we all want to fail. So I want to ask everyone, what can you do? Well, this is the first thing you can do is you can volunteer and mentor. It doesn't really matter how much time you spend, but if someone actually, one of these little kids, and I actually saw one of these kids out in front of old fashioned, if you just give them a second and say, hey, you know what, you can do better, and all you have to do is do this. Or watch me and then learn from me. And what else can you do? You can do nothing. And actually, uh, people think that, hey, I'm not doing anything, I'm part of the problem. In this case, no, you're not a part of the problem. Just, you know, just sit and just observe. Don't do anything. Because guess what? It's going to get better. I promise you. So, off of the melodramatic part of Brian talking about being a black guy, um, and on to Men's Swan. So, by show of hands, who knows what Men's Swan means? All right, for the people who haven't been educated on this, it stands for math is nice, so we are nice. Um, I remember the first time I heard this, and I think I heard it while he was speaking, and this picture is used by permission from Dan Benjamin, my actual employer, so you can actually yes. Um, so that means maths are nice, are nice, so we are nice. And I start thinking, does that really make sense? Math is Asian. Are we Asian? <laughs> <laughs> oh, some of us are. But I'm not Asian. Um, Matt's created a programming language. Are we creating programming languages? There are people on here who are creating programming languages, so you can't raise your hand. But, um, so, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is we cannot strive to be like someone else. And usually, when, we, when people make things like men swan, they have an ulterior motive. I also want to talk about nice. Nice is a, a very cliche thing. We should be nice. You should be nice on Twitter, Brian. You shouldn't tell someone that their code that is obviously broken is broken, because you know what, Brian? That's not nice. But is that nice? I think it is nice. It's nice for me to let you know that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It's 11.45, John. So, perhaps we shouldn't be so nice. Perhaps what we should be is more truthful. Maybe we should um, embrace the thing that, you know, the world isn't nice. Nice things don't always happen. Very subtle, 11.45. All right. So nice things don't always happen. Maybe we shouldn't be so nice. And I just wanted to, I wanted to change the saying, I know it won't happen. Matt is nice because Matt is nice. If you heard this guy talk, he's probably the most humble person ever. And, you know, seeing him at ReadyConf in these conferences with these question and answering sessions, you feel that this guy is very passionate about what he's doing. And that's why it works so well. But that's not <laughs> So, does Matt being nice have anything to do with Brian being nice? No, no, not, not at all. It's not that. I'm kind of a jerk. <laughs> and, and, you know, and you know why I know this? Jeff Kastner is sitting in the front row because he's looking to heckle me. <laughs> <laughs> so, back to this men's wine thing. Um, one last thing I want to say about men's wine it isn't passive aggressive ammunition. 
And, and I do see it used as that, where we are, we are using men's lawn as, as a guide for us to be assholes. And the last thing about this, about this section is um, we have to remember it takes a community to raise a child. It takes all sorts of type of people to build our community. I mean, we can have nice people, but we also need jerks like me to keep that in mind whenever we go too far into nice. So, um, to summarize, um, there's a website called makeeverythingokay.com, and so next time you feel that you need a little, you need some more niceness in your life, just go click on this button. Everything will be okay. <laughs> so, um, a little bit of um, a little bit of history on this talk. I always told myself, I actually, there's two more talks types that I want to do. I want I want to do a type a talk where I cuss every other word, and I think I did it before three years ago. I wanted to do talks where I actually teach code. I've done this. Now what I wanted to do, and actually what I really wanted to do was a talk like Bob Martin last year at Rails Comp, did a talk where he had no cars. And he just walked around the slot on the stage, throwing them off, throwing them off, throwing them around. I wanted to do that with this talk, but I decided that you guys have really short attention spans, so I should just look up on the screen. So, and I also always wanted to do a talk where it was like an axe. So this talk actually does have five acts, and we are in act number three. And it's entitled the Black Kid with the Code. And the reason I'm talking about this is um, I know this is being recorded, and I want to be able to show to people that hey, someone like me can get on stage and ramble for 25, 30 minutes. So that's me, Brian Miles, when I had hair. I can still grow it, but I prefer not to have it. <laughs> so I want to start with a story about me. Because um, this is actually Brian Miles for the top, and you guys are just going to check the comments. So I started off with a uh, Color Computer 3. Do you might know what Color Computer 3 is? Maybe you might know it by its other name, Trash 80. Anyone here have a Trash 80? Yeah. Yes. My father bought me one of these. And I have to give it up to my father. He, um, he was very poor when he grew up. He actually went to Vietnam at 16, lied about his age because he figured killing people in rice paddies was better than me. So he's like, you know what? This whole computer thing is pretty neat. I'm going to get on that. And he got me a color computer free. So I operated that. Actually, I tore it up and tore the tape drive up because I wanted to see the side of it. So we, then we got a Tandy 1000 TL. Does anyone know what this thing is? A Tandy 1000 TL was an 8286 because I got the TL and it had a turbo button on it. <laughs> Come on, think about it. Computer with a turbo button. <laughs> and you know the first thing I did, um, because he wanted me to learn a programming language. My first programming language was basic. Wrong. C. I learned C as my first programming language. And the reason why is because my father spent all this money on these programming things, on these books, and they came in like little white booklets in one week or two weeks. And I learned C, and I thought this is programming. I love this. As a matter of fact, I've never programmed this before in my life. So after um, understanding C and getting and, and actually understanding C and really being able to use it, I learned a second language. Um, I think I have a problem. Uh, most people are like, well, I'll go from C to this is probably in the 80s. C to Pascal. No, I couldn't do that. I went to a simpler, 8086 is simpler. Um, I pirated a copy of Born on Passion. And I actually started writing games in a summer. And the reason why is I love looking bits. I don't like looking at things with a huge macro layer. I like a really tiny layer. So here's this, this, uh, a little discussion about what I like about this. So um, when we were little kids, I know all you 20 or 20 year olds um, might not understand this. When I was a little kid, we didn't have VGA. Matter of fact, when I started, we had. We had VGA, we were a VGA. Some crappy, you know, it was really, really bad. So when VGA came out, it was off 640 by 480, 256 colors. Oh my gosh, it's like cut up. <laughs> but there's a problem with VGA. Back then, the hardware was really slow. So what you could do is you could actually go into the video card, and you could actually hack video cards at this time. You could flip. You could actually say, instead of being mode 13, you could switch it to mode 13H, and what you would get is two buffers, 320 by 200, to 
guess what I can do then if I have two buffers? Page flipping. Page flipping, which means I can have motion. I was actually very, very big in the, like, the 80s demo scene. It was my thing. I loved demos. I thought I was going to write games and, and be amazing. Don't wait for that. So after, after I got tired of DOS, I've never really ever used Windows. I went from DOS, I heard about this thing called Linux. I was like, I'm going to download it. So the first night I started, I put a block drive in the disk. I went to sleep. I had no apparent clue. I woke up. I took it out. The next night, I did it again. This went on for like 20 nights. 20 bits to install Linux back in the early 90s. And I loved it. I was like, this is like DOS. But it's great. So I love it so much that um, my parents never gave me anything. So we had this cheap, crappy sound blaster um, sound card. I was like, well, sound doesn't work. So I looked at another sound driver and I said, well, guess what? I can do this. I wrote a sound driver in 1994. I was actually 17 when I had my first um, Linux kernel patch accepted. But no one knew it was a black hat. Kind of cool. So at the same time, um, I was going to high school. Oh, I was barely going to high school. I went every day, but I was awful. You were attending high school. I, was, I attended high school. I didn't really, I didn't read. Actually, in high school, I read one book, Day of Sun. One book. <laughs> My whole entire high school. I was awful at high school. But I figured out in ninth grade that all you needed was 1.7 GPA to have to actually graduate in four years. So I got 1.7 GPA. <laughs> But I also figured out that you could do anything if you fit in people's molds. So I did. And I actually scored 1570 on the SAT. You young kids don't understand the significance of this because they realize that these, these millennials um, need to fit, so they actually added more sections. At one time, 1570 was, uh, I think I might have just, well, I didn't get an answer wrong. I got one little piece of an answer wrong. I mean, it was basically almost perfect. 1600 was yeah, 1600 would have been perfect. And I scored perfect on the, on the ACT. And this, is a, and this is significant to me because um, at this time, back in the mid-90s, we knew that tests were, um, they were, they were biased against minorities. We knew this because we actually speak different at home. I'll go into that some other time. That's why you missed the 30 points. That's why I missed the 30 points. <laughs> so, um, the parents are like, well, you did great in your test. You need to go to college. I'm like, I don't want to go to college. College is expensive. So now they're going to go. So I went to the library one day. I opened up a college book. I flipped it to a random page. I did like this. I picked the school. Indiana Institute of Technology. I applied, and I got in. I literally applied to one school for college. <laughs> so I went. And I remember my first year in, um, the guy, uh, my computer science professor, and I'll never forget this. I won't mention his name. He's a jerk. But he says, you can't code like me, but you can't code. And I'm like, well, um, I've written a kernel driver. Um, I know some of them. What do you mean I can't code? And, and they always fit, like, you don't fit the mold. So that's fine. I quit school. So I started working at Fort Wayne Internet. Um, that, was, that was pretty good. I learned a lot. But once again, I was fired because I didn't fit the mold. I didn't do things the way that the status quo liked to do things. Then I went to Digex. Um, there was a whole thing about them starting at 9 and me wanting to start at 10. So they fired me again. I didn't fit the mold. But this is something I did do while I did this. Does anyone know what this is on the screen here? The left browser. No, look to the right. Let's look on the right bar. Like what is that? Next, 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 next. It looks like Next. It's Window Maker. I wrote the first version of the widget library in Xlib for Window Maker called Wings in 96. And actually, and I'm really proud of this because it looked like crap and Xlib sucks. Have you ever seen Xlib programming docs? It's awful. But I wrote this. And you know, the whole time I was writing this, people were telling me, Brian, you don't get, you don't fit the mold. But I was able to write something that was pretty significant for the time, and someone still maintains Window Maker to this day. So then I went working for a network security company, and I was doing installs, running, roaming through the Midwest, and once again, they're like, "Let's come to work every day." Like, Why? I'm not doing something every day. So they fired me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on. Um, so between 1997-ish and, and last year, I had a whole bunch of other jobs. 
quit every single one of them. And you know why I quit every single one of them? Because I didn't fix the moment. But then I realized something. And um, I have a new boss now. And my new boss is me. And guess what? This is me making faces at the computer. And um, I fit the mold. And I get the, the lesson out of this is um, don't ever, ever let anyone tell you that you don't fit. If you don't fit, move on. Then find a place that you do fit. Because everyone in here out here on a Friday, not billing, not making money, but actually sitting and listening to me rant about myself. So um, moving on. I got nine minutes. So um, common sense over convention. So Rails came out in um, six, seven years ago. Oh, five, six years ago. And the big thing was um, was um, convention over configuration. And the good thing is Jeff Casimir is sitting here in the front row because he actually got me thinking about this. Um, conventions are really, really good. We need conventions. Rails. The, the use of conventions in Rails just makes it so easy to use. It makes it easy for um, groups of developers and teams to become acclimated to a Rails project that isn't written by a bunch of idiots really, really quickly. But we need to learn to realize something. One side doesn't fit all. Your conventions are your conventions, but they're not the best conventions for me. So we must adapt. So I think one example of something of convention that I guess is a convention that we like now. Um, skinny controller fat model, and I took on Jeff because he actually had a talk title talking about fat models. And so I said, you know what, I'm talking to Ruby, so I'm going to put code on this range. So we have a kind controller, and we have a kind controller because we're in um, Madison and like Hal's out here. And, and for the uninitiated, kind is a plural of cow. So what this cow does, what this, what this, um, what this method does, this action does, is it milks a cow. So given a cow with ID, ID can be messy. We find our cow, and then we, we allocate a milking machine, and, and if we can milk the cow with the milking machine, we respond with a status of 200, and we say that it was, it was milked. But if not, we say it was 401, and it was unable to milk. Well, the um, skinny model, or skinny controller, um, that model, says, well, why don't you just dump everything that you can't put in the controller into the model? And people um, take that a little too literally. So here's a better way, here's another way. Why don't the, the model or the controller never need to know about the milk machine? It just says, cow, milk yourself. <laughs> and now the control, we remove this little code. I actually did this very simply so everyone can follow along. But um, now we just tell the cow to milk itself, and if the cow can milk itself, it will actually report with the right status. That's why. So um, why is this important? Um, well, Bob Martin, he created Solid and those interesting videos, and the guy that's talking about space and bad politics. And he created um, <laughs> Solid. And the solid, the acronym solid, I don't really, I can never remember all of them off the top of my head. But one thing he always says is, whenever you're doing OO, you tell, you don't ask. In our original example, we were asking about the milking process. In OO, you don't do that. You just tell, hey cow, milk yourself. <laughs> so, back on a topic, I don't know if it is a topic, is um, your business logic, or so back. Okay, so back to your um, back to your models versus your controllers. People like to take all the code out of the controllers and put it into very heavy model methods. Don't do that. Your um, your Rails models can actually should only be the physical models should only be the code that actually interacts with the actual persistence or query of your um, of your business logic. Everything else can go um, I don't know the directory. Um, actually, I started like, a little controversy on Twitter a couple months ago, and my consensus is at lib. So I wanted to get to this section. I have six minutes, and I have like 20 more slides. Thanks, you guys, for bearing with me. But um, So I've been coding for over 20 years, and I've come up with a list of 20 or so items of how to be an awesome coder. So first thing I want to tell all you kids, you know, guys who are younger than me, uh, younger than um, 29, that um, it takes time. Um, intelligence is like everyone in here in this room is probably highly intelligent, but to take like a D and D turn, that wisdom line 
that you need to understand the difference between right and wrong, that takes time. time. You can only gain wisdom through experience. Um, another thing is, knee hacks are neat. And the reason I put this slide in here, um, news Ruby controversy with the RBM versus RBM. Um, the RBM, the new one, is, is a neat hack. It's neat, but it doesn't need to be the new hot thing. It can just be neat. And, it, and they both can exist in their own little silos without any friction in between them. Just understand, your neat hacks are your neat hacks. Um, nothing replaces actual knowledge. Um, and this goes to all the coders who think that they can program what a system that does. Um, and especially with the rise of, of packages like um, Chef and Puppet, there's a, there's a little bit of knowledge required that goes into actually being able to understand production stats. And you can't just code your way around that. Um, question everything loudly in public. I prefer to do Twitter all the time. You'll, you'll see it in the afternoon about two or three. I will start trolling Twitter. <laughs> and then the flip side is your feelings might get hurt. That's fine. But the way you make sure take those feelings being hurt as a lesson, never enact revenge. Revenge makes you an even bigger jerk than I am. Um, another thing is don't forget that there are other smart people out there. Um, we as developers can think that our solutions are great, and they are great because we are smart. We fail to realize that sometimes there are other smart ways of doing the same thing. Um, anyone here really into um, Christianity and religion? What do you mean by into? Okay, come <laughs> here. They might say something that might offend you. In the Bible, it says, "Be humble and meek." Um, as a developer, you can't be meek. You can't be submissive. You can be humble and say, "You know, that's that's a great job you did, Ray." But don't be submissive. You have to. You can't be as a developer. So I decided to write a code. Um, so one thing that we like to do in, in our in our um, in our field is we have all of our successes are built on other people's successes. So um, I don't remember what GS stands for, but um, we'll just say that it is good stuff of you is own is is a function of good stuff from others plus your ingenuity. And actually, I, I really do believe this, that all of our successes are built on other people's successes, and we always need to acknowledge that. Um, we need to reflect constantly. We need to tell ourselves, hey, you know, I didn't do well there, and I can accept that, but I'll do better next time. We need to embrace your youthfulness. Um, young guys, realize that one day you're going to get married and have kids, then you're not going to be able to do open source what you want to anymore, because you're going to want to spend time with your kids, or away from your kids. Not <laughs> <laughs> um, be a part of the team. If you work for a company that has a business side, realize that they provide value too. Just because you code does not mean that you are bringing the only things to the table. They bring stuff too. But be skeptical. Um, take care of yourself. If um, you think you're a fat slob, you're probably a fat slob. Um, and only you can fix that problem. Um, learn to identify our react shape. Um, a lot of us, I mean, that is, that is going to kill all of us, yak shaves. But the flip side of that is learning to get out of the yak shave. Um, I like to do this. I actually write on a piece of paper. Um, if I ever take a, a different change of thought, I write where I, I was doing and I circle it. And what ends up happening is I get a long line of where I was going. And sometimes it has trees. It looks kind of like a mind map. Um, keep looking for the simpler solution. Um, Groups of people are stupid. And I will prove this to you. If I were to go right up here and yell, fire is fire, what would we do? We would not go order the door. We would stand up and we would panic and we would look around. You gotta watch that. We have to understand that. That groups of people are not very smart. Um, yeah, that was dry. Um, dry is something we, we attempt to achieve. It is not something that we do. We need to remember that. Because something being dry for the sake of being dry is probably um, giving up things like um, ease, of, ease of use or readability. Um, I put a Jason quote in my, in my talk just because. Um, one thing you remember is Ruby sucks. And I'll, and I'll finish this. Ruby sucks at doing things that need to be fast. Ruby sucks at things that need careful of things like embedding. We need to remember that Ruby is good at what it's good at, but there are other solutions for other things. And next, last slide, trust your instincts. Um, 
And I guess that goes back to the wisdom. Trust, always trust your instincts. And number 20 is, don't be a follower. And this is me. Um, I like this picture, so I put it in my slides twice. Um, so thank you guys. There was no booing or hissing or anything like that, so I think that you guys probably liked it. Um, so <laughs> thank you, and make sure, and look at that, I have 19 seconds. I think I did pretty well. So um, thanks you guys, and I'm glad to see you guys today. Uh, Getty Images is a uh, stock photography and uh, music and video company, which basically means that we sell to businesses that put uh, media presentations, advertisements together. Uh, we're the big player in that market. It's about a $2 billion industry and we're about a billion dollars worth of that. Um, we have many brands, Getty Images, Punch Stock, Photos, Think Stock, uh, iStock Photo, and, and a couple of others. Um, it's a pretty fun business to be in. Uh, it's a creative business. Uh, we appreciate creative people and, and uh, and we have a lot of fun doing what we do.